Hello, welcome to Make Your Mark, a podcast with Hit Marker, looking at specific professions in gaming and esports and breaking them down with people who are much smarter than I in them. Today I'm joined by Mitsuko, who is head of partnerships at .x, a newish agency that I don't know if you focus exclusively on esports, but uh, we can get into that and find out exactly now. Yeah. So no. do you do gaming and esports or is it just esports? Because I think most companies at this point have given up on just doing esports and go, why we limit ourselves just to that when gaming's a huge pie we can go into? Yeah, so we are gaming and esports. Um, I think I was very much, I just work in esports and then yes. uh, started doing more with creators and you kind of realise when you do stuff with content creators that it's not really esports it's broader gaming so that's part of the reason um we do do stuff that's kind of specifically esports and broadcast talent things like that but um yeah we've also become a uh, branch out into esports and gaming rather than just pure the, the esports purist <laughs> mm-hmm. and i i'm trying to think there's maybe a couple that still do esports only and they go really hard on like the player front uh and I'd say there's only maybe a few games in a few regions within those games where you can like really make a lot of money off of it because of <laughs> there's just not a lot of scenes that are really established like that. So if you look at like Counter Strike in Europe or something, it's much better than Counter Strike in, in North America, and thus the market is quite limited. So it makes sense to to branch out and cover as much of gaming as you can, of course, right? And even myself, I was an esports purist. I still am, realistically, mindset wise, <laughs> for like four four and a half years or something. But like obviously, it hit marker now. Um, we serve the gaming industry, so uh, I will get actual gaming guests on this podcast at some point. But it's all been esports <laughs> so far, which yeah, yeah, obviously <laughs> it, it, it shows what's what. Really, it shows where my priorities are. But I do care about gaming, honest. And and, and what one what I wanted to get into straight away just to demystify things, um, because there are different types of a- uh, agencies, of course. Like, what do you see as the the main functions of an agency in, in gaming and esports? Um, yeah, sure. So I think, well, I think the word agency generally has some kind of, it's somewhat problematic as a definition because there are so many different facets to what an agency can be. It can be, you know, marketing agency, talent management, um, you know, consultancy as well. Um, so I think if we look specifically at talent management, um, and something that I try to stick to, although it's a hard habit to break, is calling .x a talent management company, not an agency. Okay. Um, but I think that the main purpose is kind of twofold. Number one, to protect the rights of the talent you represent. And number two is to give them new opportunities and help them grow their career. Um, I think outside of that, and kind of there are loads of agencies out there, you know, loads of them that focus on talent management, there are numerous things that agencies can offer for that that i mean they'll differ from place to place depending on what their offering is or maybe where their strengths lie um so you get ones that will focus on like content optimization um you'll get other ones that specifically do like seo for creators um or ones that are you know as you as you said specifically focused on like players and esports mm-hmm. um so i think rather than like there being a strict function, it kind of depends on uh, the company and what it is that they're targeting. And I think that's how a lot of different agencies are also trying to differentiate themselves is in the types of Got services it. that they offer. Yeah, I agree. There, there are a bunch of different types out there, right? And that's why I chucked it out as broad as, as anything. First off, just to kind of show that because I, I've never worked for an agency, so... I probably have a lot to learn on that front, but like, what would you say .x provides slash offers that other talent management companies don't then, uh, since there are quite a few of you operating in, in the industry? Yeah, so I think it's something that was like, one of the early things, obviously, that we were thinking about is with there being, it is a saturated market for agencies and talent management companies specifically. Um, And I think one of the early key factors was the tie to Morgan Sports Law, um, which is a leading international sports law firm. They do a lot in the uh, kind of like representation of athletes. Um, And a a headline for us was you don't have to choose between having a great lawyer and having a great talent manager, having a great agent. Um, You get access to extremely experienced lawyers, uh, gaming savvy lawyers, people like Nick, RMD, uh, without having to pay 
hourly heavy legal fees um but also having people like myself and the other staff that we have on our talent team that know the gaming and esports space inside out you know we know how to manage the commercial side of things we know what we're talking about when we talk to brands in the gaming space or brands that want to activate in the gaming space so you kind of get that mixture of the two rather than just oh either you know someone that knows law or you know someone that knows gaming like we really wanted to be the the middle ground in in that area got you and you just said you know the ins the ins oh god outs I'm of gaming so we're gonna we're gonna do a 20 question quiz right oh, now please don't and i'm, no, I'm joking i'm <laughs> expecting 20 out of 20 or else i'm sorry we're gonna have to put a little warning up saying misinformation there uh, <laughs> <laughs> i should have said no, but, uh, sorry esports expert and consultant <laughs> The two <laughs> phrases I hate the most in this industry. <laughs> exactly. That's an... I mean, yeah, I, I've always seen you as an expert and a consultant, if, if that means anything. Well, I think that might be uh, an insult at this point, knowing how you think of yes. it. Yes, so... that, that, was, that was the point. That was the point. But I apologize. It is a joke. <laughs> but uh, are, are there not some, hmm, some conflicts, potentially, having lawyers and agencies under the same banner? Uh, in what regard? Say you want legal advice on a contract you are maybe signing with Dot X. Yeah. And Dot X go. You can speak to our MD, who is a lawyer. He's reliable. He will. He will see you right, and then he can just advise you to get into a contract uh, with Dot X, which inherently could be a conflict. So, if they were signing into a contract, for example, they were signing into a contract to be exclusively represented by us as their talent manager, mm. I wouldn't advise. You know, I wouldn't advise them. Hey, we'll advise you on this contract you're signing. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, they should definitely go <laughs> speak to some someone else yeah, on yeah. that. Um, <laughs> I think that that would make zero sense. Um, but by and large, that's pretty much the only contract that they'll sign with us um all the other contracts will be you know them and whatever deal it is they're entering into it's not hey you know you need to sign a contract with us about doing this particular sponsorship deal or anything like that um and i think that's uh one of the things that we're pretty keen to steer clear of is specifically con conflicts of interest you know we don't want to be representing uh for example like a player and doing consultancy work or any type of work for a team at the same time like that that stuff that we are I think very aware of and I think because we have the kind of expectations and um you know law firms have to be very careful around how they do things like there's a lot of regulation in that area and I think because of that it's something that we really tie to what we do is making sure we're professional making sure that everything we do is with integrity um we don't well, I think, A, we don't want to do something that would fall in the realms of conflict of interest or something that was unprofessional. But to a kind of second part to that, we cannot do that. I think that, you know, I don't think uh, the people at Morgan Sports would be very happy if, you know, a business that was tied to them was operating in really fishy ways. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't see it as, as conflict of interest in terms of having lawyers at Morgan Sports or doing work as well. Got you. And that, that's not me trying to catch you guys. Like, there was none of that there. It wasn't even planned. It was just when I was thinking of thinking through it then. You know what? I'm like, I just have to I have to ask that. But I'm certainly not trying to catch you or have a gotcha moment or anything by any means. But like, so when you say um, talent, uh, talent management, bloody hell, talent, that's a, that's a new one. Um, so that in, does that, that includes creators, broadcast talent and players and such like. Uh, yeah. how how do you go about navigating managing each of them because i assume they've all got different demands and, and needs and kind of goals moving forward yeah so we have pretty different service offerings for each um i think you know that they're all very different um you know players will need stuff to do with transfers and placements where a creator like likely won't same with broadcast talent will have specifically you know hosting gigs or casting gigs which are very different to um signing a player contract or getting a stream sponsorship. Um, at the same time, there's also a degree of overlap. So some of the service offering that we do for players does overlap with stuff that we do for creators because oftentimes players and broadcast talent are also influencers in their own right. They'll 
you know, create yeah. content or brands will want to um, buy placements on their platforms, anything like that. So um, there are kind of areas of service offering to do with like sponsorships and endorsements or opportunity sourcing or brand development that are across all of them. But then there are very specific services that we offer to players or broadcast talent that creators, you know, they won't really ever require those services. Got you. And as, as head of partnerships over there, like what would you say your the bulk of your time is spent doing and working on? Um, so my, well, at the moment, because we're still growing, you know, we only launched end of January. I wear a lot of hats. Um, I'm okay, one pretty, of them, one of them, like I'm pretty involved in the kind of day to day of talent we represent. Um, but my main focus is, uh, on outbound work. So going out, speaking to brands, speaking to companies that either we identify as a good fit for our talent or that our talent want to work with and trying to make things happen. Um, I would say at the moment it's more on the creator front uh, or more on the kind of like sponsorships and endorsements front. Um, but I think one of the cool things about that is I let I get to be a lot more creative, a lot more kind of proposition oriented, developing campaigns that aren't just like, hey, do you want to buy a 30 second YouTube <laughs> integration and being mm-hmm. a bit more like, you know, what can we develop that is a really good fit for the creator um, that is impactful for the brand, but actually means that the creator gets to do interesting stuff, which tends to actually perform better for the brand anyway. Um, Beyond that, I also provide quite a lot of insight around the commercial side. So uh, looking at um, if a deal may or may not be worth moving forwards with, or, you know, for broadcast talent, if you've got two conflicting gigs, which one might be better career wise to consider taking, Ultimately, the talent will get to make decision at the end of the day, but um, kind of giving advice on on that side of things is something that's pretty key to what I do as well. Got you. So it's a lot. And do you make the, the cups of teas for the colleagues and stuff as well in the office? Um, no, I only make my own <laughs> cups of teas, but uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's... You're just not doing enough, I'm sorry. I know. I mean, <laughs> I should... No, I... <laughs> Luckily, um, well, to be honest, I quite like varied work. And I think that's one of the things about talent management is it's quite varied. Um, It's, Mm -hmm. you know, you do some sales, you do some marketing, you do some like data analysis, you do some talking to people and networking. And uh, I think that's what drew me generally to like, to working with talent is I don't want to be sat here doing the same thing, copy paste Mm -hmm. every single day. Uh, I need some variety and I think that I've always done roles that have kept me busy and kept me doing loads and loads of different things Um, so I'm used to it in many ways and I think that probably I would be uh, struggling if that got narrowed down too much but yeah I'll I'll, uh, I won't be making anyone else's coffees I don't think (laughs) because with the title of head of partnerships I just imagine you like massive office every day just like (laughs) On the phone with Intel, like, no, it's 20 grand for that placement. And then you've got another one, you're like, Facebook, you're like, no, not happening, not exclusive for you. He's staying at YouTube, like, just just being the hard one, just like going at all these brands 24 7. But uh, it's, it's nice that you, you've got you've got plenty on, and that will obviously give you a real good un- understanding of like how this thing runs, like, 365 understanding of that shit. Yeah, I mean, I was I gonna think... say holistic, but that I don't like that word for some reason. Okay, well, it's a good thing I didn't say the word holistic when it came to... Uh, oh, you was going to, though, weren't you? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the words that is a, a frequent... I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's, it's something that's used a lot by, like, uh, agencies and, and talent companies yeah. and stuff, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think definitely... Well, I, to be a little bit rewind Mitsuko of, I don't know, 2015 or whenever it was when I was still at uni... Um, mm. I did not think I'd end up in a partnerships role, like at all. I was very much, oh, I'm going to do marketing and like brand or like creative. And I think partnerships is very much like, or I think the image of partnerships is kind of the one that you had where it's very like (laughs) negotiating, do the hard, you know, here's the numbers and Uh uh, sort out some stuff. And there is a lot of that type of, you know, you do negotiate, you do have to draw a line, you do kind of have the, jump on one call to the next and try and make stuff happen. Um, But I think that, I I don't, 
I think it's something that we've focused on at .x, but also generally something that I want and something that I know that I enjoy and hopefully I'm good at is the um, bringing something more creative to partnerships. Like I, rather than just bashing out the numbers, I want to make stuff work. That means that the next time we talk to a specific brand and go, let's do this again, uh, they'll have had a good experience working with the creator, but also working with us and been like, oh yeah, you know, we were able to do some really cool stuff. Like I don't really, I don't really care about being like, oh, I've worked with this, this, and this brand. I'd much rather be like, I did this cool thing with this brand and this creator, or we put together this that was, you know, exciting and innovative, or um, it was something that our talent really wanted to do. You know, it was a thing that they had outlined as at some point in my career, I want to do this. And we did that for them. Then perfect. I've done, I've done my job is yeah, the ideal for me and hopefully what I will continue doing and do better as we grow as a as a company awesome stuff and you mentioned university in there and I feel like I have to ask this because obviously <laughs> in esports universities are a, a big deal especially in like the the UK as well it's a hot mm. topic but like do you feel like it's benefited you a lot as you get into the stage of your career now and or like another way of putting it do you think you could have gotten to this point without university without what you learned there um I would say no um but I think it's quite unique to like people's individual experiences um the reason why I think it helped me is I did not I don't think I'd have ever considered esports as a career if I didn't go to university um I really liked gaming I really liked esports but I didn't I was very much in the mindset of like well I think I was already in the mindset of go to university get a degree try and get a high paying job um uh, obviously <laughs> when you go into esports <laughs> yeah, instead i went to the gaming society and realized oh maybe this is fun as a career um <laughs> maybe to the dismay of my parents at the time but uh it i think that that coupled with the fact that i was extremely introverted before university like i did not like speaking to people i didn't know um i didn't do public speaking I hated interviews. I knew I was really good at the writing part, but if I ever got on to like a job interview where it was like, now it's time to speak with your interviewer, I would probably, I would get shaky. I would stutter. Um, and I think university just made me over the three years, a lot more confident and a lot more able to deal with social situations, which is great considering partnerships is a very social thing. Talent management mm-hmm. is extremely social and relationships based. So for me, it had a massive impact. Um, I also grew up in the bubble of, uh, I didn't, I, I think I, I was not very independent and university made me a lot more independent as well. And I think that's something that's really important, especially in my role now is just being able to be proactive and go out and do stuff by myself and not be like scared to go out and network or turn up to an event and speak to people so yeah Mm -hmm. much of this industry is who you know right and especially in a role like yours but even even outside of that it's like the number one piece of advice given by anyone in any like esports and gaming talk but (laughs) so it seems like almost cliche and redundant at that point but like it's because it is so important i mean it's just like almost a, a prerequisite to to getting getting things done yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it is, especially in the UK, it feels like, you know, there's, you know, kind of everyone that works in UK esports, especially through Twitter. And I'll have heard of people, I think, especially when I look at students these days, like, there are a lot of students where I'll be like, oh, yeah, I know this person. And it'll immediately be like, why do I know this person? It's just because they've reached out or they've been active on Twitter and like, we're mu- we mutual follow each other. It feels very mm-hmm. rare to not know someone now that's kind of seriously looking to work in the space because they'll have made that attempt. But I also think it's just, yeah, trying to be proactive with networking as well. Um, it's very important. And I, I want to switch gears just for a second. Yeah. I don't normally do this, but I feel like I need to ask because I feel like I'm going to get an amazing answer. Uh-oh. What What was the game, the primary game that got you into esports? Well, hopefully... I think I can guess it, but I want to know oh, the answer know. first. Okay. Um, it is 
League of Legends. Was that was that what you had, or was it something else? That that was number one. Yes. What was number two? That, number two would be Overwatch. I've never I played one game of Overwatch uh, in my life. Respect. Um, Respect. I think it was League of Legends, and then I really enjoyed watching CS. Um, like I was not good at playing it. I found it <laughs> amazing to watch. Um, yeah. And I like I think it was one of the second esports events I went to was like, uh, uh, was it ECS? Well, I can't remember. It was something. Yeah. It probably would have been like ECS eight or something. Yeah. Something like that, that I, I watched and I was like, Oh my God, amazing. Um, but yeah, I don't even know why I got into league of legends because none of my friends played it. I was not a PC gamer. I was exclusively console. I think up until I was about 13. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so I don't think that was a very uh, interesting answer. But no, 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 it's yeah, it's yeah. interesting. I think I think <laughs> the games that people that that got people into esports are, are quite telling about who they are sometimes, occasionally. What what it's, is the Legends first game? I'm, I'm not I'm not willing to divulge my theory just yet. It's, <laughs> it's a work in progress. I've I've got my years of experience, and I, I'm just trying to work out an exact map now. Of course, it's not an exact science. But uh, I just find it interesting. Is it still League and CS as your top two now? Are those the, the ones that um, you watch and, and stay up with, with the most? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I I watched Valorant a bit and I tried to play it a bit, but I think just FPS games are not for me. Um, Got you. I think they're like, I would love to be amazing at those games, but I'm just, my reaction times are terrible. So, uh, and my aim is terrible. So that's not great. Um, you just need to put in like many hours ahead of time just to get your aim to an acceptable point and then you can start working yeah. and everything else. It's it's a well, slog. I, I think that the the other thing is, and maybe this is something that you can um, also agree with, is if you work in East like them if you work in esports or gaming, the less games you start playing, like you just stop playing games because your entire life is talking about it. And then afterwards I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I guess I'll just read or watch a Netflix show or something instead. I definitely don't play as much games anymore. How, how often would you say you play games now? Um, well, I mean, I would still say every day, but it's like, you know, I'm not playing seriously. It'll just be like, I'll play a game with my friends, like one right. or two, and then that's it. Rather than what I was like at university or even like in the first year probably of me working where I was every day I'd play <laughs> you know as many games as possible to try and improve at the game or mm-hmm. on the weekends wake up play League of Legends uh eat go to sleep so that was <laughs> <laughs> good I, I I think I play to be generous once every 10 days for about oh. an hour and then I'm done what do you play I, I've got Halo Infinite. That's oh, that's what I play. Yeah, because it's just like I can kind of yeah. jump on and it's light. Uh, it's it's I don't know. I feel like I don't really lose a lot of skill in between. You know, I'm just like average at all times. So that's fine. <laughs> you know, but there are some games where like if you haven't played for a couple of weeks and you jump back on, it's like you've never played it before. Yeah. Uh, I can't be doing that. But yeah, so I I can 100% agree that uh, with a lot of people in in the industry. Um. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You still like games, but it's just it's the last thing on your mind occasionally. Is like, yeah. okay, I've spent a day <laughs> talking about how to activate this League of Legends thing. I, you know what? Let's play League of Legends. Like, yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, <laughs> it is what it is. But um, that that's a a serious consideration if you want to turn like what could be someone's like main hobby or passion into something you get paid to do because that that yeah. does change how you view it. Yeah. For sure. 100% and then it's something that I don't I don't know it's spoken about a bit but but not enough and uh that ends the casual segment this is supposed to be super <laughs> professional I apologize but I was curious because uh I, I, I had League of Legends in mind and I wasn't sure why so I had to ask but um I'm gonna try and catch you out a little bit here okay. uh, are there any red flags uh immediate red flags for agencies say like we'll say talent management or something like that um, red I, I have from, one. Like the talent side or from like working for an agency? I'd, I'd say on the talent side first, at least. Um, lack of transparency. Um, if you, you know, often you will probably be reached out to by an agency. Um, if you have that call and you go, hey, how do you, like, how does it work? And they can't give you 
um, you know, however it is they operate, if it's a flat fee, if it's a percentage cut that they take from stuff, if they can't tell you that, um, then that's a red flag. And also the other thing that I'd probably say, and I know there's a lot of discussion around it, is particularly on the player front or even on the creator front, if they're like, oh, we also take a percent of your donations or like your prize winnings or whatever. And they're not, I mean, A, I don't think that's great. And B, if they don't tell you that and suddenly it's in the contract that you're about to sign, um, big red flag. <laughs> Well, I'm interested to hear what your your one was, though, if it's different. Well, I, I was thinking about the... Uh, I, I believe this wholeheartedly. Some of the agencies that manage players... Yeah. I believe they make moves that are, I don't know, unproductive or mm. uh, go against the actual nature of giving someone the best chance possible to be the most competitive as possible. If they sign, say... I'm thinking of a game in particular. We'll say CS, right? For no random re- for no reason. It's completely random, of course. But like, I, f- I find like sometimes they will get players who are approaching their prime or in their prime and lock them down for like four years in a contract, which could seem like a lot of money. It's a good commitment for four years. like, And, and the, the agent and the agency at that point know, depending on how they get their money, but like a lot of the times they'll know they've got a good like stream of income there yeah. locked in where it may actually be in the best interest of the player to have a short contract so then they can negotiate against the team or they can move out easier and not get locked in like hell where you're benched for ages or like you just can't make the move because your buyout is astronomical and no one's willing to pay it like i think there are moves in which i think the long-term stuff in esports which is not particularly a long-term um you know it's not a prospect for a lot of players right now I don't know how to minimize that into calling it a direct red flag and just saying blah, blah, blah. But like, because some long-term agreements can be good, sure. But I, f- I find that seems to be almost anti-competitive in a lot of ways. And it's something I, I use it as a mark against that agency whenever I see it. Just just for myself, of course, who doesn't work in that space. So I'm not saying I know best, but it just seems off. I think it's just, I think it's very difficult to... I, well, I think it's difficult to identify externally and I think it's difficult to deal with if it's happening to you as a player at the time because a lot of the time it's younger people that, you know, they have an agent that needs to have their best interests in mind and obviously there's a financial incentive sometimes for agencies to be like, you know, let's do this deal because it's uh, money in the bank, right? And mm-hmm. Um, whilst I'd like to be like, you know, agents should be acting in the best interest of the player. Ultimately, the decision to, should be up to the, the talent as to what they want to do. And you give them advice, the best advice you can possibly give them, and they can make that decision. Um, I think from an external pers- perspective, it's hard to be like, oh, you know, the agency was in the wrong for that, because you don't know whether actually they advise them a completely different thing. It might have been what that, um, there'll be pros and cons to, to both sides of signing into something short term or signing into something long term and it'll be um it's hard to look at something from the outside and be like oh you know that agency forced Uh, like the only times you're really i think can make a hard judgment on it is if you hear that player being like my agency told me to sign this and they said it would be the best move for me and then yeah uh (laughs) if it was very obvious that they only did that because it was um easy and money in the money in the bank then yeah that's terrible that's not a good thing but I think the other thing is sometimes and like I know this from my end you'll be like this is not a good idea don't you know here's the here's the good thing of you doing that here's the bad thing I would suggest you do I would suggest you do that or I'd suggest you don't do that and sometimes um like it's not my job to force them to do one of the two um and they might decide against the advice that I give and that's that's fine. Ultimately, it's their career. Um, but I think it would also be bad if I were to try and force them to do, you know, maybe the thing that is better for them in the in the long term or is better for them in the short term or whatever the situation is. Um, so I think on the red, like I, I can agree with your concerns, but I think it's also one of those that's <laughs> like really hard to put as a red flag because it's just yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. hard to identify, um, especially externally. And I think, um, yeah, it's one of those where it's like, uh, if you, 
uh, to be like all agents should put their talent um, and their best interests at my, you know, at the at the front of mind, and that's what they should serve to exist. Um, it's very, it's all well and good to say that and be like, oh yes, nice, nice, nice. Um, in reality, does that happen all the time? Probably not. Um, which is a sad case, but it's yeah, sad. just just uh, something I try to avoid being like, oh, you <laughs> can't believe you did that when I have no idea what it was that the conversation was. And I, I guess, I guess the fact that we're early on in esports as well, which is rather unregulated, that yeah. that may, that allows it's almost a breeding ground for people who are looking to come in, get a quick book, and and f off, right? So uh, yeah. I, I guess that's no different in the talent space of of esports as well. Yeah, unfortunately, not accusing you guys of that, by the way. <laughs> by the way. I think you guys are good, but <laughs> like, Dotex are endorsed by me, Adam Fitch. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's comparatively a very new space. Um, and, you know, there isn't much regulation. There aren't people that can be like, oh, I've been a talent manager in esports for 50 years. Um, or I'm the, I, you know, this company has done talent management for 50 years and, or 30 years. Um, that's not really the case. I think there's a kind of a bit of a disparity at the moment between major talent companies that don't do stuff in esports and gaming that do have that background that are now starting to look into esports but they are having agents that don't really understand esports and gaming doing that work or they're getting very junior people in to do that work and then that doesn't really necessarily solve the problem or you're getting esports and gaming kind of endemic agencies coming out but that they don't have you know that historic um expertise and experience to be like yes we've been doing this for x amount of you know decades and decades uh we know what mm -hmm. we're doing and we've got the background to to prove it um i think it will take time it will um but like pretty sure pokemon did she not launch like rts uh yes so like she's that, just gonna that fix it, last it? Year, i think everything's gonna be fine if pokemon's involved right um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, which is going to solve it all and create like the the best standard for the industry i'm sure i think it's i mean it is definitely it feels like a new agency pops up all the time um mm. you know it's something that ahead of launching dot x we were like oh there's another one and it makes it more and more scary to be like you know what is our usp what is the defining difference um, ultimately mm -hmm. when it comes to talent choosing an agency but I also think that makes it quite um probably intimidating as well for talent to know who like is their career at the end of the day they are making a decision that will impact their career um especially if they sign into a contract with an agency that might be um if it's exclusive like six years to uh, six years six months to a year to two years um that there's so much choice out there now and a lot of people um that can like i think can come out of nowhere and be like yes hello i'm an agent i will do this stuff um for you and oversell and often under under deliver um which i think burns a lot of people as well that have bad experiences yeah. where i think having an agent is a great thing like i think that it is um you know on the player side having your rights protected on the broadcast talent side, you know, same thing, but also potential to have someone really advocating on your behalf to find you new opportunities, same with creators, um, help you develop your brand. I think there are so many good points of having a talent manager, but I can totally understand why so many talent are like, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> tried it before being bad. Don't want to look at it again or the whole idea of having to talk to 10 different agencies to figure out which one's the right one when all of them are giving you a very very nice pitch is hard mm -hmm. i imagine yeah I, I mean and like what would you say uh how do i put this like what position would somebody need to be in to actually have a serious uh kind of claim to needing a manager so say like as an up-and-coming creator or like quite yeah. a new creator like at what at what point do you think uh, uh, an a, an agent or you know like management can actually aid them? 
Um, I think it varies from, again, I think it varies from agency. I think it varies per creator. Um, I think some agencies are, will probably be very hands off and you could, and they'll be very cheap because of that. Um, that might help with just understanding what your rates are and just do the negotiating part and that's it. And that might be extremely useful to you if you're someone that, um, has a really high, uh, kind of um, amount of content that you're constantly pushing out and you don't have time to do that stuff or you just literally have no idea what you're supposed to be pricing yourself at even having that for a little bit might be useful regardless of how big you are um i would say that it doesn't make sense if you are um starting out like six months in and have you know couple thousand followers on different platforms averaging like 20 ccv on twitch i don't think you know it's better for you to focus on building up your brand than having uh especially if you're trying to go full-time with it um whatever agency it is you work with obviously they have to be making it commercially viable for themselves so they're gonna you know take a cut or charge a flat fee whatever it is that's going to be coming out of your already limited probably paycheck for doing Mm -hmm. stuff. And I think it's just way better at that point when things are still manageable for you to do it yourself. When it comes to the point of you're getting quite a lot of inbound stuff coming in and it's taking time away from create content creation, or you just, you know, you're getting stuff that you're reading and you're like, I have no idea how I'm supposed to be dealing with this. Um, or you're having to sign into contracts and you have not, you know, you're like, oh, I don't, I can't get a lawyer to do this. And I don't know what it is that I'm agreeing to. Then I think it's worth at least having some conversations. Um, and I think you get people that are, you know, if they are a content creator, at like the 50 CCV range, if they're a player, you know, you don't have to be playing in the biggest competitions in the world to think about stuff like that. Um, I think that that kind of level is it's worth just having the conversation and considering things and finding the right, you know, you you might be able to find the right agency from the get go, or maybe you chat with a couple and you realize that's just really not what I want right now. Um, and I think the, the bigger you get from there, probably the more important it is. Um, I think, you know, a, a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think with broadcast talent and creators, you have and even with players actually you just have so much stuff on that having someone that knows how to deal with it you know deal with inquiries or help it continue to expand your career is really really valuable um and means that you can focus on being the best at you know creating content or playing the game in a competitive at a competitive level or um you know prepping for whatever broadcast you're doing um means that you can just continue to kind of like scale up rather than be like, oh God, I have to deal with 10 different emails of stuff and chase people up and chase for, you know, being paid is like another thing as well, like chasing for payments or yeah. trying to read over contracts and not know what you're looking for. Um, I, like, any, I think that's been a long rambling answer, but I don't think that there I is a number or, you know, mm-hmm. it's not like, oh, you have to be bigger than this amount to to look at it, I think you can look at it at any level, but it becomes more economical and more effective the bigger you are. Right, because I I think I've seen a few examples that over the years, not too many where they're like, oh, I need an agent. Like just because they feel like it adds like an air of legitimacy to what they do and almost it's like maybe a a milestone in the journey of becoming like a Mm full-time whatever it is, streamer. YouTube or whatever it may be, it's almost like a rite of passage. Like, oh, I need need an agent, of course. Like, how am I gonna do this otherwise? And I get to have that, that fancy email in my in my Twitter bio. I look real mad professional. You know, I've seen that, and they maybe have like, I don't know, ten YouTube subscribers, and they've been doing it for four years, and no one's really tuning in besides like their mum and themselves. And it's just like, ah, uh, maybe maybe not yet, mate. Uh, you, there's, there's bigger fish to fry at that point and that's <laughs> getting yourself on an upward trajectory you know so uh yeah it's a mad one it is a mad one but uh i want to kind of as we hurtle towards the end of this <laughs> um they kind of speak about getting into this line of work from a perspective of working 
at a, a management company or an agency. Yeah. Um, are there any set paths to do so? Uh, as you say, you didn't expect to be head of partnerships at an agency. So, like, <laughs> are, are there any set paths, or do you do you just make it happen over time? Um, so, I think that because every agency is so different, um, I think like you need to think about what aspect you really enjoy and would want to see yourself in. I don't think there are set paths. You know, it's very. I mean, the other thing is within a talent management company, there are lots of different roles. Um, there are, and there are particular skills that might accompany those roles. Like, you know, we have, um, I do partnerships, um, but there's also people that are dedicated entirely to doing talent management. That might have the role like talent exec, talent manager, talent director. Um, you'll also have people that maybe work exclusively on like the campaign side or, you know, as with any business, uh, uh, business side for the talent management company as a company and not about the the talent they represent so it's very diverse in that aspect um i think you need to kind of figure out what it is that you want to do within that if it's that you want to work at a talent management company because you really like working with talent then you know what i think as we already spoke about there are players broadcast talent creators what which one of those do you have an interest in if, you know, that can be narrowed down? If it's actually all of them, I love esports and gaming in general. I really like influencers. Um, then I think it's, okay, great. Um, probably the best thing is to try and get some experience in that area or really understand that area. So with creators, maybe it's really understanding social platforms, really understanding, um, like, Twitch, YouTube, streaming, um, or maybe it, on the player front, it's really understanding like the competitive landscape and the player landscape and what transfers going on in a particular game and then mm-hmm. finding the right company to work for. But I think it's, I don't think there is a clear path into it. And I think that's maybe one of the issues from a um, getting into it perspective, but also a hiring perspective is how are you supposed to get experience as a talent manager? It's it's so difficult, I think, to break in from the get-go unless you go, oh, I'm going to start my own agency or I'm going to exactly. reach out to some friends who's content creators and try and just do their work for them. Um, but actually, if we, if we specifically talk around hiring junior people, I'm not expecting anyone that I hire that's junior to know how to do talent management because how can I expect them to get experience in an area that's quite closed off? Um, right so so what what qualities do you look for at that point then instead of the experience yeah um so i think generally there's kind of key areas being able to communicate well being able to organize yourself um, and your work and being proactive i think are really important when it comes to talent management um all of those things i think mean that if you lack in any of those areas you're probably going to struggle to be an effective talent manager. You have to be able to communicate things with the talent that you represent, but also with clients. Um, You have to be able to organize yourself because often you're doing lots of different things, whether that's for one talent or for many talent or for a bunch of brands. Um, You need to stay on top of that stuff because it's you're responsible for that person's livelihood, their career. If you miss something, that means that they miss something, that's on you. So it's really important to be organized. Um, And when it comes to looking at those skills, um, like I think that that's something that can be identified through work that is specifically in esports or or gaming, or it can be stuff outside of that. You know, maybe you organized an event for a local thing uh, that you did, or you were able to communicate really well to set up a gaming regular gaming night with your friends that you stream on twitch like stuff like that even though some people might be like oh i don't have any gaming experience even stuff like that if you're able to take that and be like this is what i did and this is what shows that i think that stuff is really compelling as well to look at from a hiring perspective awesome so what i get from that a lot of it is is to say it requires the same qualities in which you would be a desirable hire basically anywhere yeah. <laughs> for, for the most part, of course, like communication is not important in some 
some roles, if you're a janitor or something, I suppose, then fair enough. You maybe don't need to be good at that. But <laughs> also, I like, yes, yeah, so not not anything particularly unique. Like, it's good to have as much knowledge in the area you want to get into ahead of time. If you understand how the ecosystem works, and that is a that is a head start, I, I suppose that is definitely a benefit. But as you say, like, as you don't expect that experience up front, so it's just about uh, as as you said just te- teen yourself up in those ways. But I, I I think if I wanted to work for .x, I would like literally study how, who they've gone for, who you've got as clients. And then I, I would try and understand how their, how those clients work and look at them as a business and say, yeah. okay, how, how, how are they making money? What would they be losing money on? What do they need help managing? All that kind of stuff and get a, a taste for it as much as I can, even if, you know, as you say, like there's no set route per se. I think there's little bits and bobs you can do, and that probably rings true for most of the jobs out there in the in the industry. So that's somewhat annoying in that there's not a direct way of getting into it, of yeah. course, because it would be nice if you could just say, just follow steps one, two, and three, and there you are, you <laughs> are an agent or a manager. Um, it would be nice if it's like that. The nature of the beast. Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if it's like that in the future, and maybe it will be. Um, I think it's something that we... It's something that I thought about a lot when we launched Dot X is that I knew that we would be hiring junior people and I never had, you know, here's the training on how to be a great talent manager and I put in mm-hmm. place a training program for people that joined. That means, you know, there is here's session one, two, three, four, five about different areas. Uh there's a lot more, I guess, formal training wise. Um, I don't think there is that for someone, you know, either graduating university or finishing school and looking to get into the space um maybe in the next five ten years it might improve i think things will be maybe you'll start seeing things like internships at talent management companies that enable you to get that hands-on experience or maybe there is workshops that people can do um i don't think that'll be right now but maybe in the future um i think that maybe you could set up uh, an esports certification uh yeah that definitely wasn't the direction i was uh hoping to <laughs> with that suggestion but um okay never mind i was just throwing it out there <laughs> sorry adam i disapprove of your idea but um no i think that the one other thing i would say that i do look for is someone that genuinely wants to do talent management um i think it's not the most you know well it's not one of the careers that I haven't heard that many people go, oh, I really want to be a talent manager when it comes to like working no. in esports. Um, I think it is an exciting and like fulfilling career, but I think it's, um, I've had a lot of interviews where someone will be like, I just want to get into esports. And, you know, this just happens to be like the job <laughs> that is available as junior. I think really mm. knowing that you want to do talent management definitely stands out versus you know someone that might have good skills but they just don't care about working with talent that's not where their interest lies um because yeah. you often get the best work out of wanting to do the work or like wanting sure. to to do that particular thing um rather than just being like this is my stepping stone into doing something in esports um so yeah that's probably the other thing that i would say about trying to get into it <laughs> show your passion uh- for wanting the role <laughs> I saw, and it makes like I don't think I've spoken to anyone that's ever said, "Yeah, I want to I manage talent." <laughs> Actually, I don't think I ever have in my life. Now you say it, so that's a good I point. Think the, I did <laughs> when I started. The, out, but so. those that do say that will stand out. Yeah, and that is a, that is a good thing because, like, you're not going to lie about that. I don't think it's it's not a trendy thing to say or anything. Else. Like, <laughs> I've, I've not really seen it. But um, in light of time, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, Firstly, thank you for coming on and like, you know, the knowledge and experience is unparalleled. You are the best person in the industry by far. So thank you very much. I will pay you (laughs) your appearance fee after this. Thank you. I've been haggling with your agent about it um, and they've not moved down a cent. So you're getting all of it. Um, And (laughs) an opportunity to plug, of course, whatever, whatever you want within reason, of course, don't be plugging, you know, like russia or something um well thank you adam for inviting (laughs) me on as well anyway um i think obviously if you are listening to this and you are a talent then um please go to www.xtalent.com uh it has pretty much everything about us that you need to know um how to get in touch with us 
Um, if you are a person that's looking to get into talent management and just want to chat about the career, um, what it's like, then you can also reach me at Mitsuko on Twitter. It's literally just my name, uh, M-I-T-S-O-U-K-O. So clean. I'm so <laughs> jealous. Um, but yeah, I'm always happy to, to chat with stuff um, to do with, you know, whether that's specifically talent management or just having a career in esports and gaming. I'm a pretty open door. Um, I think that is everything that I want to plug. Shout out to Adam Fitch. (laughs) (laughs) For God's sake. Right, well, uh, thank you again, mate. I appreciate you taking the time and for everyone watching slash listening because we're on Spotify, uh, Apple and Google at this point now. I've reluctantly put them on there. So uh, we'll see how those go. I'm not going to waste the time if no one's (laughs) listening there. I'll tell you that much, but we shall see. So um, thank you everyone for watching slash listening and we'll see you on the next episode of Make Your Mark. Cheers.